While my first musical love was rap, my real passion for music lies in metal. Metal to me is just the pinnacle of modern music. Particularly of all the genres of metal that stand out to me, death metal is probably my favorite. Of the plethora of artists that call this sound their home, there is one exemplary band that I constantly come back to. A band that not only completely embodies the sound of death metal, but makes it their own while exploding with their unique subject matter and approach to the extreme music. I'm talking here about Bolt Thrower. This Coventry England based metal band would have a long, however incredibly enigmatic career that would come to an inevitable close upon the sudden death of one of metal's greatest drummers. Their history is long and filled with lineup changes and fruitless rumors, but one thing that always remained consistent was the music. Their sound was so unique and incredibly defined, especially within the subcontext of death metal. When you hear a bolt thrower song, you know it's bolt thrower. From the subject matter strictly encircling themes and concepts of war, the addicting and impactful melodies, to the enduring thickness of the rhythm section, everything about this band's music is high quality, gut-wrenching, yet inspiring death metal at its finest. Their catalog of music is pretty vast too, consisting of 8 full studio albums, 3 EPs, 4 demos, and a few compilation albums. This is especially an important point considering it is their contributions to metal and its sound that establish this band as not only legendary, but iconic within the sphere of metal. Bands like War, Necrogoblicon, and Ailstorm all have solidified their image around a gimmick and count Bolt Thrower among those bands because they did the very same. They followed it through in a different way however. Instead of dressing and looking a specific part, they focused expressly on the art. The album art and the lyrics always revolved around some aspect of war, whether it was shelling enemy positions or dealing with dangerous weapon systems on the battlefield, everything you could think about war, both modern and historical, was covered by Bolt Thrower. I may be over exaggerating as not every single song was about war, but damn near every song they wrote was. Another thing about the band is that they count themselves among being the coveted echelon of artists who have never released a bad album. Every release from Bolt Thrower will have you utterly jamming along with their addictively violent riffs and their entrancing rhythms. While they are together no more, the band's contributions to metal run deep. Many bands touring within and outside this genre of death metal look to Bolt Thrower as inspirations, and in the early years, the band helped flesh out the sound of death metal and make it as iconic as it is today. So without further ado, let's explore the artistic endeavors of the band Bolt Thrower and see just how influential the band is, was, and why their music is so good and go through their history from formation to breakup. This is the Bolt Thrower Documentary. Bolt Thrower would be born out of an impromptu melding of the minds of its two founding members in a Coventry pub toilet in September 1986. There was a hardcore punk show and bassist and future guitarist Gavin Ward and guitarist Barry Thompson were nerding out over their love for games, workshops, Warhammer 40k, and metal music. And so it was an easy conjoining of these two kindred souls. Bolt Thrower would be named after a primary unit in the game Warhammer 40k, and they would be born as a grindcore band. After this formation, drummer Andrew Whale and vocalist Alan West would jump on to join the band and continue on to produce the first demo, April 1987's In Battle There Is No Law. Bolt Thrower's debut was explosive. The demo is wildly different from what we understood Bolt Thrower to be today. Still impactful and successful for the band, enough so that they would go on to record a second demo, Concession of Pain, five months later in September. At this point, Gavin Ward had switched to guitars and so Alex Tweedy was recruited to play bass. This would quickly fall through however as he did not make it to the recording, forcing Gavin to play both guitar and bass for the demo. Two weeks after this blunder, the now legendary and bull thrower mainstay, Joanne Bench, would replace Tweedy. Having listened to Bull Thrower's second demo, John Peel, the alternative DJ of BBC Radio 1, would contact the band about recording a Peel session. 
With their new lineup, Boltor would go on to record their first Peel session with John Peel on January 3rd, 1988. The session consisted of four tracks and resulted in Boltor's breakthrough deal, a contract with Vinyl Solution, to release a single album. Just before recording their first LP, they would replace singer Alan West with their driver, another key member of Bolt Roar, Carl Willits. After this replacement, they would go on to record their debut LP, which takes the name of the first demo, In Battle There Is No Law. The album was only a half hour in length, but that's all the band needed to get you addicted to their sound. It could be a little primitive, but there was a lot to enjoy on this album, and I promise, the production gets way better. The one thing consistent with the band from this time forward was their focus on war. Nearly every track is a dedication to this violent human pastime, and the sound does an amazing job at capturing its intensity. The album art further encapsulates the goriness of war, with its hand-drawn mutilations and depictions of death. The production quality was pretty low on this demo, which further helped categorize it as a traditional grindcore album. I think some songs seriously suffer from this lower production quality, like Challenge for Power, which is just sounds like an amalgamation of noise until the bridge where the guitar is just so muddy it loses a lot of its power. All in all though, their debut is pretty good with some minor complaints, and considering it was just a demo, in my eyes, it wasn't to be taken as seriously as their future LPs, and if you thought this demo was good, strap in boys because Bolt Thrower is the gift that kept on giving. Given that their label, Vinyl Solutions, was a pure hardcore label at the time, they did little in the way of promotion for Bolt Thrower on In Battle There Is No Law, and the band predicted this would continue. So just after one album, the contract was satisfied and Bolt Thrower would not seek renewal, instead opting to sign to another label, more suited to their style and sound. And that label was Earache Records. This label had also signed other death metal acts like Napalm Death and Carcass, making it a more suitable home for Bolt Thrower. And this new relationship would see their second record come to life, 1989's Realm of Chaos, Slaves to Darkness. Their sophomore release would see Bolt Thrower using work by artist John Sibick under contract with Games Workshop. It is said that members of Games Workshop, after they heard the second Peel session from November 1988, they extended the offer to provide the artwork for the band's album. Without a second thought, the band quickly accepted the offer in 88, and then the album would release in 89. The Warhammer influence is very present on this album, from the artwork to the music and lyrics, to even some songs like Plague Bearer and World Eater being directly about the Warhammer games. This album would also represent a drastic progression from their debut album in nearly every way, the speed was much faster, the production was cleaner and tighter, and this was where the heavy riffs of Bolt Thrower would enter the picture. Every track has hard-hitting riffs, which quickly became a cornerstone to the band's sound. As for the rhythm section, there is a heavy emphasis on blast beats in most of the tracks, and one thing about this album was Bench's bass was really low in the mix, and it gets blocked out by the blast beats and the chaotic guitar solos. All around, whether this album is your taste or not, it would be iconic in establishing the now famous Bolt Thrower style. Following Realm of Chaos, Bolt Thrower embarked on a tour called the Grind Crusher Tour. Along for the ride was label mates Carcass, Morbid Angel, and Napalm Death. Following the end of the tour, a third and final Peel session was recorded in July 1990, and it was back into the studio for the band. The five members were busy cooking up their album entitled War Master, which was recorded at the same studio the Realm of Chaos LP was recorded at, Slaughterhouse Studios, which burnt down two weeks after wrapping up in 1991. This was yet another huge step in progression for the band's sound. If it was truly born with Realm of Chaos, then War Master perfected it, the grindcore influences were almost completely abandoned on this record, and the sound was strictly metal. Warmaster would also be the final album to feature blast beats before being abandoned, 
never to be touched by Bolthor again in their history. They foresaw how stale that style would become pretty early. Being that it is closer to traditional death metal, the album is actually a lot better to me than anything Bolthor had released previously, and of the first three releases, this is my favorite for sure. Upon the announcement of the album, Games Workshop once again offered to do the album artwork. However, this time the band considered the offer too expensive and would eventually decline. Instead, Max Joe Graphics would be contracted to do the design and artwork, and I'd say they did a great job on the album art. It excels at conveying the image that the band had established on their previous album, and at the end of the day, still looks like a similar style despite the more medieval fantasy subject matter. Tracks like Cenotaph serve as the thematic continuation of World Eater from the previous record. This was also the first instance of Boltror recycling riffs. The closing riff on World Eater is the same as the opening riff on Cenotaph. In this case, it was forgivable given the context of a loose connection between the songs. However, to some critics, Boltror has been notorious over their career of heavily recycling riffs. To me, I just don't see it. After listening to their library countless times, they have some similar sounding riffs for sure, but who doesn't after how many years in the business? But even then, there are some slight differences and they lead into completely unique and standalone songs. Warmaster would also feature a video for the track Cenotaph, which helped the band a little bit in breaking through to an American audience, which at the time, the band was mostly confined to the European scene. Because of this, there was an American tour to promote the album, where the band repurposed an old US school bus as a tour bus, equipping it with tons of computer games. After 1991's success in War Master, Boltador would waste no time to captivate the world's violent imaginations once again. By August 1992, the band was back in the studio, this time at Sawmill Studios, recording their next LP, The Fourth Crusade. The title of this album extends to the historical Fourth Crusade and the capturing of Constantinople. Further pushing the point, the cover artwork deviates greatly from the past Boltador albums and is this time a painting by Eugene Delacroix depicting the entry of the Crusaders in Constantinople. For the past three releases in Boltoro's catalog, a big feature was speed, and on every release it would get faster and faster. This came to a screeching halt with the Fourth Crusade, and the band would dramatically slow the pacing of the riffs and rhythms. Due to the slower speed, the album has a more death slash doom style, and songs like As the World Burns and This Time It's War really exemplify this. The track Embers furthers the whole riff recycling argument by taking the same riff in Cenotaph and incorporating it into a new song. I honestly think it's a tenuous argument at best as it consists of a small section of the song and leads into something entirely new and different. Anyways, The Fourth Crusade was a baller album and really helped to carve out both Roar's niche in metal. All band members are at their peak performance at this point. Carl Willits really has some gut-wrenching vocals throughout the album. Whale on drums delivers some hard-hitting grooves, and especially because the album is slower, has a lot of timing in his performance. The melodies from Baz Thompson are some of the band's most iconic. Ward and Bench also fire, of course, on all cylinders to deliver some really cool rhythms. The album is outstanding, with one critique being the production value, which, while it doesn't really negate the listening experience, it doesn't allow some songs to really shine. That being said, it was still in higher quality than the previous LPs released by the band. For Victory was a penultimate moment for our most beloved Bards of War, Boltror. The album would be the final with drummer Andrew Whale, and for the time being, the final with Carl Willits. Both members left the band amicably and cited differences in life directions. The American tour that ensued from the release of For Victory would turn out to be a complete disaster for reasons I found difficult to uncover. Maybe they couldn't keep up with the touring life, or were planning something else entirely. Regardless, their final recorded performances would be something for the ages. 
The album itself is absolutely banger. The band went in with an all-out fusion of their slower music coupled with their faster paced tunes. It was a match made in heaven and even the album artwork was something not entirely expected from Boltrower. Instead of the usual hand-drawn or painted album cover, the band settled on a photograph illustrating silhouettes of heavily equipped soldiers overlooking a series of lakes, also cut out by silhouettes of hills. It's actually a pretty imposing photo and totally captures the feel of the album in one image. From the start, the album is smashing. The opening track, War, does an incredible job at introducing the listener to the ensuing madness. The standout tracks for me would be the title track for Victory, followed by Lest We Forget with that entrancing main riff, and excluding the intro track, Remembrance. The album would also mark the beginning of the band's lineup woes, as for pretty much every album cycle afterward, the band would be plagued with lineup changes, particularly the vocals and drums. With Willits and Whale leaving the band, the void that they had left would of course have to be filled, and in record time, the band would both find their new vocalist and their new drummer. The new vocalist would be Martin Van Drunen, the former vocalist for Pestilence, and the legendary Martin Kitty Kearns would take over his talent with the drum kit. For a few years following the release of For Victory and the new lineup changes, Boltrower would commit to the road and would continuously tour. This was a great, albeit bitter time to be a Boltrower fan. On one hand, you had the amazing and growing library of music, and on the other, with Willits and Wales' departure, it felt like Boltrower had lost some family members. Apparently, this bitterness would resonate with the new vocalist Martin Van Thrunen, as after the 95 and 96 tours, he would eventually leave the band in 97, having not recorded a single album with the band. He has discussed that he never felt like a full member of the band and his personal struggle with a disease that caused hair loss, leading to extreme anxiety on stage. In his absence, a longtime friend of the band, Dave Ingram, would stand in. To add insult to injury, shortly after Van Drennen's departure, Martin Kearns would also decide to leave the band, with Alex Thomas taking over drumming responsibilities. Despite all these changes to the Boltrower lineup, there would be one silver lining in that Carl Willits would rejoin the band for recording their next album. Adding to the band's struggles though, as well, was their transition from record labels, from Earache to Metal Blade Records. In the wake of the For Victory tour, the band still had sour tastes in their mouths when it came to Earache, and their promotion and support for the album. So Boltrower was looking for a new home immediately, and of course would find that in Metal Blade Records. As I mentioned, Willits rejoined the band to record an album, and so by 97, fans knew something was cooking for Boltrower. This would undoubtedly manifest as another absolute banging album, and that is Mercenary. Being the first album released by Boltrower under the Metal Blade umbrella, this album would bring with it a whole new slew of amazing tracks, one of which became among their most known and top rated tracks. Mercenary also felt like a real extension of Boltrower's sound. Most tracks are a lot slower than what Boltrower fans were accustomed to, but it all works out so incredibly. In regards to the album artwork, the band went with a classic approach and went with a painting featuring an operative doing reconnaissance on what seems to be a mountain or rock face on the enemy lines. The painting is titled Contact, Wait Out, which happens to be the first track on the follow-up album, Honor, Valor, Pride. It totally bleeds bolt roar and is among the best album covers from the band in my opinion. Now onto the tracks. The music here is excellent and I would obviously count No Guts No Glory among the best pieces of bolt roar music out there. But also I would say that Powder Burns is a contender for an amazing bolt roar track. Powder Burns also acts as a conceptual continuation of the song Embers from the Fourth Crusade, which also leads into the track The Kill Chain on Those Once Loyal. Needless to say, the album is outstanding and just proved how good Bolt Roar truly was. They released hit after hit album in the death metal scene and really drove home the whole point of the genre. Sick riffs, deep gutturals, and dark subject matter. Mercenary really delivers. <laughs>
Following Mercenary success, the band launched on a European tour, but without Willits, Dave Ingram took over vocals. It was a huge success, but after another departure would hit Bolt Roar, as Alex Thomas would put down the drumsticks, citing a lack of interest in the band's musical direction. This of course left the drums open for the return of none other than the man himself, Martin Kearns, who rejoined in the year 2000. With this classic lineup of the usual strings members, Joe Bench, Gavin Ward, and Barry Thompson, Dave Ingram on vocals, and Martin Kearns on the drums, the band would eventually go into the studio in July 2001 to record their next studio album. This next album would be titled Honor, Valor, Pride and would build and expand the bolt roar sound that Mercenary explored. It's a little slower like Mercenary, but of course still features the pounding vocals and the inspiring riffs we've all come to expect from the metal legends. Honor, Valor, Pride is the only studio album that does not include Carl Willits on vocals, and it's definitely noticeable, but Ingram does an amazing job maintaining the bolt roar feel and sounds enough like Willits on the recordings so it's actually pretty seamless. This album is often overlooked, but truthfully, it has some real smash hits. I'd started off with Inside the Wire, a real war song made for charging at the enemy. Along with all three title tracks, I'd also slot K Machine or the Seventh Offensive as contending tracks in the Bolt Thrower library. The album artwork also continued the Bolt Thrower tradition with the depiction of war. Like the war-torn images of the past album covers, Honor, Valor, Pride features an all-out firefight between ironclad soldiers, with one front and center, mouth agape, giving his enemies some lead. It's actually one of my favorite Bolt Thrower album artworks, and really sets the tone and feel for the album and band's image. Overall, Honor, Valor, Pride is an entry totally worthy of being in the Bolt Thrower catalog of war. Now, Honor, Violet, Pride is often overlooked simply because of what came after. The next album would totally solidify the legend of Bolt Roar and fully encapsulate everything the band had tried to accomplish. Between a few tours leading up to 2004, the band would begin working on some new material that would coalesce into the next album. With the full intention of recording it and releasing it by the end of 2004, ill fortune struck again as Dave Ingram would decide to leave the band, citing personal issues and health problems. This put all plans to record the next album on the back burner until the group could find a new vocalist. It took a little while, but eventually, with nothing but pride, Carl Willits would make a grand return in November of 2004. Finally, the recording would commence and Bolt Roar's magnum opus, their crown jewel and masterpiece, Those Once Loyal, would release a year later in November 2005. I might have made it obvious by now, but I have an extreme bias to this album, as does most of the metal media. Those Once Loyal has made a huge and lasting impact on not only death metal, but the genre at large. I call this album Bolt Roar's best work with ease as it really is just that good. All of the longest standing members of the band came together like family to completely deliver a death metal masterpiece for the world to bear. Now this album is a heavy hitter, it's so difficult to choose which songs should top the album as every song is just pristine. Upon its release, Bolt Roar would find themselves finally thrust into the hallowed halls of metal legend. At very least, Those Once Loyal does an incredible job at showing how far the band has come. From production value to riff writing, this album has it all. Most songs round out some of the Bolt Thrower's most listened to music and is totally exemplary of death metal at its finest. Either way, it was expressly stated by the band that their main goal was to produce the perfect Bolt Thrower album, and it seems with Those Once Loyal, they came the closest to accomplishing this. And so, the band would postpone the recording of a follow-up LP, and instead, opt to tour to bring the newly recorded music to the world, and really show off what Bolt Roar is capable of. Those Ones Loyal just feels like a natural culmination of every Bolt Roar sound that came before, and packaged it all into one damn perfect album. There was one slight deviation, and that was the album artwork. 
It wasn't bad by any means, but the group would recreate a classic World War I photo depicting a QF 18 pounder field gun and crew in action and is found on the backside of the Guards Memorial Cenotaph in St. James Park in London. It still totally fits with the themes and imagery, but I wouldn't consider this one among my favorites for the band. Also, I won't outline too many specific songs as this album is just amazing from start to finish. But if you had to pick, give a listen to Anti-Tank Dead Armor, The Kill Chain, and When Cannons Fade. Retrospectively, it's clear to see that Those Buns Loyal is truly worthy of Boltrower's masterpiece and eventually would be known as Boltrower's final gift to the world. Hi there, you're back with Boltrower. We're just about to go into the battle, as you can see. We're all tooled up, uh, but we never walk to battle. We always go by tank. With the success of Those Once Loyal, Boltrower would hit the road hard initially. However, eventually the touring would slow down and this would begin the enigmatic section of Boltrower. Over the years, Boltrower really captivated their audience the world over, and death metal fans could not get enough. The band began touring very sparsely as the 2000s rolled into the 2010s, and people were going mad for Boltrower. This would eventually drive up the price of their merch to astronomic levels owing to the rarity that became a bolt or tour. It really is outlandish how much some of this merch costs. Whether the merch was cheap or not, it wasn't a big deal, but what was is that this was also the area of bolt career that so many rumors started about potential tours or new recordings that all fueled the enigma that was the band. Like most rumors, the majority of these would be dispelled, but it didn't stop people from creating them for their most beloved of metal artists. But alas, time goes on, and with sparse tours, fanfare over the band would steadily decline until eventually, in 2015, disaster would strike Boltrower once again, only this time it was tragically career ending. In September of 2015, sadness would rock the band we had all come to love. The longest standing drummer of the band, Martin Kearns, would sadly pass away unexpectedly at the age of 38 on September 14th, 2015. This was the longest standing drummer for Bolt Thrower, and he was easily one of metal's greatest drummers. He was cherished and most important to the band, its fans, and the entire genre. This prompted the band to respond by going on hiatus and cancelling their upcoming Australian tour, which would have been the first since 1993. A year afterward, on the anniversary of Kern's passing, the band would publicly announce on their website that they would not be continuing the Bolt Thrower legacy. They said, quote, We spent over 20 years together touring the world with three different vocalists, but he was so much more than just a drummer to us. So when we carried his coffin to his final resting place, the Bolt Thrower drummer position was buried with him. He was, and will now forever remain, the Bolt Thrower drummer our powerhouse and friend, Martin Kitty Kearns. While fans understood, of course, this came to the dismay of all of us and eventually would fire up the rumor mill once again. It seemed like every yearly anniversary of Kearns passing would spur more and more rumors of a reunion of sorts, especially on March 7, 2017, which would have been Kearns' 40th birthday. A post on the Bolt Thrower website would incite more rumors and seem to indicate that a reunion or possible new release was in the works. However, as of 2022, nothing has come about. Sadly, it seems this is truly the end of Bolt Thrower. If you've made it this far, I hope I've done a decent job at illustrating just how much powerhouse talent was in this band. Bolt Roar truly delivers every time, and during their 20 plus year run, they were most consistent unlike many artists, especially within the subgenre of death metal. Like every band or artist that's withstood the test of time, they've had their ups and downs, their days when they're on top of the world, and others filled with tragedy. Yet, regardless, they came swinging for the fences every time and truly accomplished an incredible amount with their careers. For me and countless others, they're among the legends decking the hallowed halls of metal, and especially Martin Kearns is walking within those halls as I speak these words. It's incredibly rare within any more obscure subgenre of music for a band to have this large of an impact with this much consistency. 
Another nice thing about Bolt Thrower, which may have been more of a reflection of the time, but that is the production value got better and better every time until culminating in the masterpiece that was Those Once Loyal. There's a certain poeticism to Bolt Thrower's career too. They truck forward, navigating a growing subgenre of metal until eventually evolving into a full-fledged beast of a quintet. Their music was incredible, their themes thought out, in-depth, and cohesive, and their contributions to the subgenre which they hailed from were paramount in making that genre what it is today. It's no surprise given their history, the rise and fall, that their merch commands such a high figure. It may seem outrageous to many, these prices, but maybe they're deserved given just how truly awesome Bolt Thrower is. Overall, from In Battle There Is No Law to Those Once Loyal, Bolt Thrower simply dominated. They left such an impact that their legacy will be felt for years to come. To Gavin Ward, Barry Thompson, Joe Bench, Carl Willits, Martin Kearns, and a few others, thank you so much for the incredible music over the years. May Bolt Thrower live on forever.